Hello, we'll begin our next session on the future of video and the future of MOOCs. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, our panelists today. Uh, video, making video is fun and it's hard. I should like to say that this panel is sponsored by Advil, Tums, and Nespresso. Um, uh, but that won't really be accurate. It's very hard and sometimes it presents a special set of challenges when we articulate to colleagues who are in the professoriate, um, luckily we have teachers here, when we uh, articulate to colleagues in the administration just how many uh, hours, just how many dollars making video of whatever kind, but especially video that's high quality, really takes. Um, let me introduce our panel today. Benjamin Wiggins from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Clayton Hainsworth from edX, Stephanie Ogden, our own Stephanie Ogden from the Center for Teaching and Learning uh, here at Columbia, and Philip Desen from the Institute of Hellenic Studies at Harvard and a new company uh, he will uh, uh, talk to you about. Without further ado, um, let me welcome to the uh, uh, lectern here Ben Wiggins from Penn. Uh, ben has been working uh, um, on a whole lot of fascinating courses, including uh, um, a MOOC uh, by S uh, uh, Stephanie McCurry, who is, uh, is coming to Columbia. As some of you may have heard, she was a dinner speaker last night. She's coming to Columbia, and with her coming to Columbia, her MOOC is coming to Columbia as well. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Peter, and uh, just an official passing of the torch here. Here's the hard drive with all of the project files of <laughs> Stephanie McCurry's MOOC, so it can now be uh, the Columbia version. Thank you. No problem. No problem. <laughs> all right. Um, so today I want to start by let me grab the clicker. Uh, start by taking stock. Good. Okay. Uh, so what have MOOCs taught us about learning with video so far? And I think the first lesson we can say we've learned effectively is death to the lecture capture. Uh, lecture capture was, uh, you know, setting up a camera in the back of the room. It's not engaging. Um, likewise, lecturing for an hour straight is not at all engaging. So uh, if the, even if the professor happens to be dynamic and uh, an active teacher, uh, lecture capture still fails uh, as the recording of that interaction is kind of alienating. So um, even, if, even if there is an active space, uh, you don't want to be uh, a fly on the wall in that space necessarily. Um, there's probably actually not even a fly in this world that would sit on the wall for the length of a time of a typical lecture. <laughs> so, all right, uh, chunking. Chunking is another lesson learned. Uh, just as we have found out that the lecture capture doesn't work in its alienating uh, tone, we've also found out that um, learners best interact with online materials uh, when the students uh, get these materials in chunks. Um, lectures have to be chunked up into bite-sized portions. Um, all the data we have from MOOC uh, platforms point us to tw shorter and shorter segments. Uh, four and a half minutes seems to be about an upper level. And uh, we need to encourage faculty to make their clips five minutes or less in many cases. Um, but let's be careful about what all this behavioral data about video length tells us. It does not tell us that students learn better with shorter clips. Rather, it tells us that, there's, that a series of shorter clips can hold their attention uh, longer than a single lengthy one. And this should come as no surprise. Sure, screen uh, learning is different, but decades of research on active learning classrooms have shown us the need to mix things up. That uh, chunking 
is what allows a mixed pedagogical approach in MOOCs. Uh, chunking comes at a cost though, and that cost is faculty time. So uh, please, I, I think I want to encourage all of the, uh, the faculty development people out there uh, to know that this is uh, quite a time consuming exercise for faculty. Uh, as Pascal said, I would have written a shorter letter, but I did not have the time. Um, brevity is hard to do. Um, the visual field matters. Uh, this is the third lesson from MOOCs so far. Um, at the Coursera conference last year, Coursera's analytics team presented a uh, slide that measured the interestingness of videos. Uh, and it was, it was quite a presentation by an analytics team to measure interestingness. Um, that, that sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? So how do you measure interestingness, interestingness in a video? Um, I can't say it's the most refined objective measure I've come across, but it's hard to argue with the spirit of the insight. From Edison to Godard to Spielberg, the mise-en-scene, uh, the arrangement of the elements of the visual field, uh, this is a chief concern for people working in any kind of motion pictures. But it doesn't take a French auteur or a Hollywood director to realize that the uh, arrangement uh, is not what makes an image that's interesting. Uh, so let's look at this image that Coursera uh, said is uh, a good example of interestingness. So it's pretty simple here. It's a picture of, uh, this, is, this is our slide, it's a picture of Jim Fowler from Ohio State University's calculus course, and it's an interesting image. Um, but it's also simple. There's no crane shot here. There's no uh, Robert Altman handheld camera. Uh, it's straight on. It's a clean shot. But almost anyone in this room could set this shot up. Uh, it's not at all that different from what Wharton professor Kevin Werbach's self-produced videos look like. Um, it's a head-on uh, straight shot with a person with some, uh, you know, exciting facial uh, uh, movements and uh, it's 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 pretty easy uh, to set this up. So while production matters and bad production values can get in the way of learning, um, good production values don't necessarily improve it that much beyond what general sort of interestingness looks like. Uh, engaged faculty member looking straight into the camera. Um, also, when we try to uh, let our faculty members uh, record on their own. Kevin likes to record on his own because he likes to update his content uh, constantly. He doesn't want to have overproduced videos that actually uh, dissuade him from taking into account the changes in the field. So what we can do is uh, always set our faculty up with instructions on how to best capture those things. Um, we put out, we put out uh, faculty kits that we give them guides to all the pieces of equipment and also to framing techniques. All right. So what are the next steps for videos in MOOCs? Uh, I'd say animation. Animation is where uh, we actually started at Penn. Um, at Penn, our MOOC experiment began with animation. Uh, we happen to have a true polymath on our faculty. A uh, professor who not only holds appointments in the School of Engineering, but also the School of Arts and Sciences. And he happens to be a very good animator. I'm going to see if I can play this on here. In a single variable, okay. I'm Robert so, Greist, professor you can actually turn of mathematics that sound down and electrical a bit. and systems engineering Maybe. at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. This is an online um, course. So Today what you can see is Rob is doing this animation here, and uh, Rob happens to be not only this amazing mathematics professor, but an amateur animator, and uh, this was great. It taught us the value of animation, but it was also something 
that we Chapter could show one, to other faculty and say, look at what MOOCs are doing, but we masses. can't do this for you and because that, we can't hire our uh, prolific mathematics professor, no matter how many uh, uh, great things he can do with animation. Uh, that's not his primary job. So we don't have an animator, uh, but this inspired us to uh, dig into animation, first to start off with uh, doing tidbits of animation, and then eventually um, another concern, fair use, uh, made us take the plunge into a, another second fully animated course. Um, now we have five fully animated courses on the docket, and basically no courses go by without having some animation in. Uh, at this point. In chapter four, we put okay. these tools to use. Um, so with animation, it's, it's really important because uh, areas, you get a dynamism that to applications allows you to engage someone, physics, but more important more. than the motion, more important than the general five, pleasantness of the graphic design here, what really photos, matters is there's precision. Faculty want precision in their thoughts, um, and this is not just about precision of a curve or, or precision of a scale. Uh, it's really about the fact that we can make something they can envision, um, and that's incredibly valuable. For this course, including basic algebra, okay. the ability to deal. With so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the promotion of our courses. I think we need to seriously uh, shift the promotion of our courses uh, from a strategy we had early on where uh, Coursera and edX had promotional uh, videos uh, that were featured prominently at the sign up of the page. Um, you know, my university, uh, my group uses, makes beautiful videos. I love, this is the most fun exercise that my videographers get to, get to undertake. Uh, but these are not the videos that actually get seen by that many people. Uh, these are the videos that get seen by people who navigate to the course page. They're already there. They're already thinking about taking the, the course. Um, have any of you ever seen a MOOC promo video go viral? No, I don't think so. Um, what we have to think about is how news and entertainment actually uh, capture people into their longer form media. All right, take uh, Kurzgesagt, for instance. So this is a uh, German uh, educational animation group, and uh, they have it's about nuclear power. We these have very short frustrating uh, animated so let's videos try and get that to grips with um, this topic. are called they're they're part of their in a nutshell series, and uh, they're well researched. They're expertly illustrated. It all started um, in the 1940s. And their view, the their clips, the war, without any university Soviet affiliation, nuclear are getting more views the than helping the world all of the videos in most of our courses. Imagination combined. was running so, wild. Uh, why are their three-minute clips doing so much better than our three-minute promo videos? Uh, they don't have a university affiliation. They don't have uh, all of, they, they don't necessarily even have the money that comes behind some of our MOOCs. And they are getting their word out in a big way. So this is a great use of animation. It shows the effectiveness, uh, the potential virality of animation. But this might be something that's a little easier to relate to. Uh, this is uh, the Atlantic's most recent video. And it's a video that actually promotes um, Tanahishi Coates's uh, long form piece, The Black Family in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And it's an animated video. It's lovely. It's uh, seamless. Its, its aesthetics are, are uh, gripping. And it illustrates its point in three minutes. But it's not a video about the piece. It's a standalone video about the issue at hand in the larger piece. And so it captures people by teaching them something very quickly. And this is, I think, a new promotional strategy that MOOCs have to take. All right. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about fair use. This is going to be key to the uh, future of videos in MOOCs. Um, this is a 
an issue I think that we best leave for the discussion because a lot of us have to discuss this. But uh, at UPenn, we are working on uh, getting an exemption to the DMCA, uh, specifically for MOOCs. The decision comes down from the US Copyright Court in November. So uh, hopefully there'll be some good big news to share there. Um, and we're uh, working on it the, uh, with uh, the guy who wrote the book on copyright. Uh, this is Peter DeCherney. He's going to be teaching an edX MOOC uh, very soon. So you'll see that soon. And uh, hopefully you'll have some positive news about um, DMCA issues coming up in November. So what are the next steps in MOOCs? Um, I don't think that we should ask what are the next steps in video for MOOCs. I think we need to think about what are the next steps for MOOCs and how can video supplement that. So in the next steps for MOOCs, I think MOOCs so far are not very interactive. Uh, discussion forums are great, but we need more interaction with the digital objects themselves. And uh, that may not be video. That may be um, immersive worlds. That may be things that are tangential to video. Video might not be the most accurate term uh, for, for what's going to supplement that. We also need narrative. Um, MOOCs by far, or MOOCs so far are highly engineered, but rarely do they draw out the narratives that keep a learner's attention. Um, narrative should guide the arc of each video, whether it's a lecture, whether it's an interaction, um, whether it's something else. And it should reinforce the arcs of the central concerns and conflicts of each course. This is tough to teach, though. Uh, this is maybe the most uh, difficult faculty development exercise out there. So. Uh, it's, it's something I think um, Future Learn is, is very concerned with, but I also don't see how it actually gets enacted. Um, it's going to take some serious time and skill to enact uh, narrative plans in MOOCs. And finally, on-campus education. Uh, we recently restructured part of our proposal to highlight the on-campus impact. So as um, as there's mounting pressure for to show that MOOCs are a productive, uh, fiscally sustainable exercise, uh, there's other ways to show that they um, actually do have a demonstrable value, and that's showing their on-campus impact. So that's what we're concerned about when we reevaluate or evaluate MOOCs now. And uh, that's what uh, video has to really hope to reinforce. So how does video achieve the goals of fostering increased community interaction, rich narratives, and a meaningful on-campus impact? It's pretty hard to give a single answer here. Um, but I think a turn to literature can be instructive. So for years now, a certain set of eclectic uh, literature has moved beyond the page, grouped under the heading transmedia literature by structuring the interactivity through multiple media sites, um, from websites to phone numbers to digital marginalia, all sorts of really imaginative things. These texts have foregrounded active participation of the reader and of the meaning-making process. Uh, were MOOCs to follow suit, or should MOOCs follow suit, their future would have a centralized structure of an X MOOC but the rhizomatic limitlessness and spontaneity of a CMOOC. And in such a future, the role of video will be a multi-directional and highly produced core, a flexible and iterative periphery, and a user-generated multimedia network. And so that's the future I see for MOOCs, and I can't wait to hear what the rest of the folks have to say. Wonderful. Um, Peter, first, thanks for uh, inviting me up to this. <laughs> um, when Peter asked me to talk, he asked, uh, he said, you have a unique vantage point being at edX of seeing a lot of content. And I didn't have the heart to tell you at the time, but 
I don't actually watch every video that comes through there, um, contrary to a number of the people uh, <laughs> that I speak with. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit um, and perhaps echo some of the similar uh, themes that you just heard um, and really want to talk about enhancing video content, uh, currently what's going on and then what do I see for the future. Um, particularly, you know, seeing the embrace, embracing narratives, um, a better use of the video medium, right? Right now we're, we're doing a lot of lecture capture, we're doing a lot of talking head, um, and I think everyone on this panel does not believe that's the best use um, of video. Um, again, uh, since I am someone who'd much rather be on the other side of the camera than up here, um, I figured I would show some clips. Uh, this first clip is actually from our partners in University of Queensland. Uh, it's called Crime 101. It's a criminology course. Um, and I actually took two different uh, clips, one from the, the beginning of the course, one of the first videos that you see, um, and then a follow-on piece of the actual, uh, unfortunately, what you might call lecture content, even though I just decreed that a little bit. Um, but I want to show you how they're using that actually within the uh, course itself. CCTV camera up there is broken, but the guys in the overpass found this. Oh, they didn't take long, did they? Move her back, will you? We haven't even told the family yet. Okay. Move along, we'll see what you're going to see. No, no, you need to move really from the top of the chest. So where do we begin? How are we going to find the person who committed this crime? Obviously we could look at the results of any forensic tests, we could talk to eyewitnesses and so on. But forensic tests take time and don't always provide a conclusive result. They might only provide part of the information you need. And eyewitness accounts are not always available. Now obviously in our case we have some eyewitnesses and we will return to consider eyewitness evidence shortly in a future episode. But let's start by trying to identify the suspect from what we know about the crime itself. This is called offender profiling, and one famous example of profiling is in the case of the Washington snipers. 
And so clearly they've put a, a huge amount of time and effort into creating, you know, not only a narrative in the sense of a beginning, middle, and end, but of actually taking a, uh, an event, a, a fictional event, and using it throughout the course. Um, I think it's a, a great, very interesting, this is actually coming up for rerun very soon now. Um, and I think it's a, a great use of somebody who's thought outside of the box. Clearly, it has taken a lot more planning than just put, setting up a camera um, and you know shooting yourself in your office. Um, but I think the you know where you can really see some some differences in uh, the engagement that this can create for a course. Um, some of the other uh, enhancements that, that we're already seeing, right, is the uh, improved use of graphical elements, the Im improvement of um, uh, different types of data analysis. Um, and again, um, I said increasing sophistication of visuals between generations. And what I'm talking about is the difference pre from those very first MOOCs where it was about, you know, a land grab, trying to get there first, and now with more thoughtful production, re trying to use production techniques to really underscore and use this uh, medium in the way that it should be as the, a, a visual medium and really think about not just what's being said um, or, am I, or is the proof correct, but rather what exactly is on screen. Um, we also have some uh, fairly new research, which uh, hopefully comes as no surprise to anyone, um, that pointing at things makes people look at them. Um, and this, you know, we can trace back to the second grade when you said, hey, look over there, and all your friends looked. Um, but what it really un underscores is that we as humans look at things that we point at. Uh, we notice engagement at a very basic level just from continued movement. We've all had to sit through a PowerPoint presentation with audio and struggled to stay awake or perhaps did not succeed. Um, and the idea is what we really want to do here is create sticky imagery. We want to create imagery that supports the things that we're speaking about and, and be able to provide support for instructors who may not have been thinking about this visual medium up until now. Uh, there's also what we're starting to see future in future trends, and again, really going from that that generational shift from those first first MOOCs that we that were produced to the ones that are currently um, coming up on our different platforms, um, is we're seeing a reduction in the course length. So the first ones were very traditional courses; they were 12, 13, 14 weeks. Um, now we're seeing them closer to three, four, five, six. Um, and then we're actually also seeing a reduction in the overall video content, right? We're not looking for time served in the same way that uh, instructors may have been thinking about. And I think what that comes down to is trying to succinctly deliver that content, but also making choices about what we're putting up as video itself. Um, which is great because that means that we can put more of our effort into increasing that production value. Um, Ultimately, what I think we're going to start seeing is um, improvement uh, in the technical realm of production value. As we, you know, as I see our partners, I get the opportunity to speak to almost all of our partners when we onboard them. Um, what we're seeing is that some of the original partners that we had did not have any video infrastructure. They did not have video professionals. They may have had someone who was their, uh, who would videographer or video, <laughs> videograph events but they were not someone that had a full suite of production background. We're starting to see that more and more people are investing in those kind of people, right? Um, I believe I was just hearing that there's some more animators that will be joining you very soon, uh, which is great to hear. Um, and people who can do more complicated things, they can increase the production value of courses. Um, again, the, the content will dictate that. Not all of the content makes sense to put 200, 400 hours just to make a few short videos, but there is content that does. Um, some of the other thing is we're also seeing a proliferation of studio and studio-based capture. Um, and some of that uh, is, is great because we're starting to see tools, we're starting to not run into very basic things like, oh, the audio isn't so great. Oh, there's inconsistencies between these videos. Um, but by the next clip that I want to show you is actually from one of our, our members who the course is about to launch in November from KU Leuven um, called uh, Trends on E-Psychology. Uh, and basically what they've done is create a very different, um, uh, they have a very different use of a green screen. So instead of putting up 
words or graphs or data. They've used it to really create an atmosphere, to really create the place in which this course is going to take place. This treatment is used throughout the entire course. Um, it really creates a strong mood um, and ultimately uh, has a, a very uh, interesting delivery. For decades, scientists and practitioners in psychology have been doing the best they can to improve people's lives by promoting healthy behavior, and with some success. But clearly they, I mean we, should do better, and we can. The digital revolution has opened new perspectives in that respect. All sorts of digital means and e-tools are now available that can assist you in boosting the promotion of healthy behavior. Healthy behavior for yourself, your friends and family, but also for your community, your work site, or your patients. And we look at life in its full complexity, the biopsychosocial reality as it is. And so we have chosen to present cases of e-based promotion of physical, mental, and social health. If you don't want to miss out on some of the latest and most exciting e-developments in each of these areas, then sign into our e-psychology MOOC. You won't regret it. And something that I found really interesting was, uh, though they use the background to create this mood and to create this space, they're not just random uh, images. They are images that support the content that they're speaking about. They're talking about applications, they're talking about e-cigarettes, they're talking about, and they use all this imagery in that background and it's out of focus and it may not su support uh, the content in the way that most people think of it, but it really creates a mood and it really um, is a, uh, it's something that they very distinctly chose, and I'm really curious to see how the, the course does, how it, how it does in retention, um, and again, knowing that that's not always the, uh, the greatest measure of everything. Um, one of the other things I want to speak about is uh, video analytics. So on the edX platform, um, in the next week or so, we're actually releasing a, a video analytics tool that will be inside our platform. Um, this is something that's really exciting for myself and for my team. Uh, it's something that allows us to look at students and try and draw some conclusions about how they're actually using that video. Um, what we can <clears throat> start to begin to see is whether or not the content that we've created is in fact doing the job that we think it is. We can try and confirm, confirm assumptions around points of engagement and potentially identify points of confusion. Um, the MOOCs are not meant to be static, right? They are meant to be iterated upon. They are meant to be changed. Um, the beauty of recording video and having different pieces of this is you can go back and change it. Um, this is uh, a course from edX um, where the solid or the lighter blue area is um, students who have watched the content throughout. Um, and then the uh, darker blue on the top is where you see replays. So you can see uh, different spots where there are spikes. I mean, you can actually go into those spots and see where the students are replaying. You can start to understand uh, and make some assumptions about what they may be trying to do. Um, another part of this tool also lets you uh, look at um, in a more granular fashion, um, the uh, entire video in a five second by five second increment. So you can see the number of unique viewers and you can actually see uh, and find places where you have high replay points. Um, a couple of these instances, uh, one was students were skipping through a very long introduction to actually get to course content. So maybe creating long introductions is not the best idea. Um, there was another instance that we looked at a video and the uh, instructor had made a joke. Uh, there was actually a, uh, a cartoon that was flashed up on the screen, it was very fast, and students were either finding it hilarious, which I'm not convinced it was the case, or they were not understanding the joke or not seeing it long enough, so they're actually going back to try and find out what it was uh, the instructor was, was showing. Um, for me, this is some of the, the very near future stuff of what we're going to start to see. The ability to really take and look at research um, and be able to look at course content um, and student interactions with that video in a far closer real time in ways that we don't have to deal with you know, big data, but actually have tools that allow for analytics. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to thank you.
So um, I, I think a little bit different than uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues up here on the stage, or friends. Um, we're a real a small, small uh, department. My mind to being told by my lovely fellow video group back there. Thank you. Um, so we're uh, the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning, and um, our video production group and our uh, whole development team. I, we're a pretty small operation, so I'm going to kind of stay with that angle. And I do think when we're thinking about the future of um, MOOCs and we're thinking about the future of video, we have to take co cost into consideration. That that's the sustainability. Um, and so, you know, um, I think we can't gloss over, um, you know, all the different institutions that want to be doing MOOCs. And, um, and, and so there has to be a, huge, a wide range of um, approaches to being able to do that. And so um, I'll uh, start with saying that, um, yeah. Yeah, well, you're going to engage that for me over there? There you go, thank you. All right, um, so um, as I was saying, I think um, it can be, um, we can do um, uh, productions that are low cost, and um, we have a huge range that we've done here at Columbia. Um, we're relatively new, I think, perhaps, um, in comparison to a lot of institutions um, in doing, uh, producing MOOCs, but we're not new in um, producing videos videos for courses and for online environments and um, um, and on other online courses and um, things like that. So um, I'm going to just show you a video, um, just to the, um, showing you the range um, of, uh, I think this video is a couple of minutes long, of the types of things we've uh, produced and then talk a little bit about our background. And then I'd like to finish up with, um, you know, talking about the future um, uh, of two different directions or a couple of different directions that I see kind of the small um, operation um, like our may be taking. If you want to know where the world you're living in came from, you need to know about the Civil War era. How the national state, the national government got to be as powerful as it is. How we went from slavery to a period of great equality and then a retreat from that into a period of considerable inequality. That helps to explain the civil rights movement and in a certain sense helps to explain how we elected the first black president in American history. This new online series explores the history of the Civil War and the reasons for its continued relevance today. We live and prosper in a literal cloud of viruses. Thousands and thousands of them impinge upon us every day. Sometimes we get sick, most of the time we're well, and sometimes maybe they even help us. You'll learn about the how, why, and where in this course on viruses. In this class, we're going to talk about the methods for analyzing the increasingly massive amounts of data now available from learners in online learning environments. Hi, my name is El Wang. I will be your TA for the Big Data in Education course. I look forward to your forum postings. Yeah. We look forward to interacting with you through the lectures, the assignments, the forum, and our open office hours. So it's great to have you in the class. See you during the semester. See you. In this episode, we'll be looking at the French cinema of the period, really certainly one of the most important national cinemas, along with a special focus on the great filmmaker Jean Renoir. We'll also look briefly at two of the most important national cinemas to have emerged during the 1930s, that of Mexico and that of Egypt. <laughs> talking about sustainable development. This is a crucial concept. I think it's crucial for the world. But what does it mean? I think our starting point has to be how crowded our world is today. We're 7.2 billion people. The numbers have soared. We're up 10 times since the start of the Industrial Revolution. 
millions more people are likely to be added to the world's population in the 21st century. This is making for a very complicated world, a world divided between great wealth and still crippling poverty, a world facing unprecedented environmental challenges. Sustainable development is really two ideas. One is a way to understand this complicated world. How do the economic, the social, the environmental, the political, the cultural factors fit together? And the second aspect of sustainable development is the idea of sensible goals for this crowded, interconnected planet. Other money in banking courses take a textbook, and there are a couple of famous textbooks, some by my colleagues here at Columbia, and I don't use them. Um, I teach this course instead from more primary texts about the money markets. This is a course about how the money markets actually work, what the institutions of them are, um, both domestically and internationally. And the reason I teach it that way is because over the years the students have worn me down. They have jobs downtown, they have internships downtown, and so they are, they are trading repo, they're on, the, they're on the euro dollar desk, and they're wondering what all this stuff is that their textbooks don't talk about. So I have brought into the class room their life um, and, and give them a sense of the big picture that makes sense. Can you go on to my next slide there? <clears throat> there we go. Um, so, um, uh, we've produced, um, uh, Columbia's produced about 17 um, MOOCs, and we have four uh, right now in production. Um, we've been producing MOOCs for probably the last uh, three years or so. And um, the range, as I said, some have been outsourced. The last two you saw were um, outsourced, and, um, and um, the uh, ones that you saw in the beginning we did internally and um, so I just wanted to give um, a little bit of um, background on how a, um, a small production team and institutions like ours that don't have the fi funding may be able to um, compete and be able to produce um, um, videos that um, and MOOCs um, that have equal um, let's see learning effectiveness um, that um, um, and I want to challenge perhaps a little bit the idea that we have to um, entertain and I wonder whether entertaining is equivalent with learning and I think it's really important that we're able to do both. I think I'm a videographer, I come from a visual background, I, you know, I love animations, I love film, the visual, but I think we also have to be able to then um, take the analytics um, um, that we're talking about and be able to apply them to learn whether are we doing, are we doing and, sit, and what we're saying that we're doing, the kind of learning that's taking place um, with our students. So anyway, um, this is our fantastic team of five and um, they do a tremendous amount. Um, MOOCs are just one of the many, many things that um, our team does. Does So we've been um, producing videos for courses and online learning for um, over 15 years. Um, and so our small production team, where this is, we're um, doing, uh, this is a training module for Teachers College. Um, we do scripted productions, and um, this is for the uh, Mailman School of Public Health um, for HIV test kit that we did with an actor actually in Spanish. Um, this is another production we did with um, a, a range of actors for teach recovery in, in Columbia Psychology, these uh, psychiatric uh, um, institute. And so these, this is a range um, of different departments and faculty um, 
that we work with, and all of this are in um, for uh, in online environments and websites. All this video content often has um, interactive elements to them. They're repositories um, that we develop, um, and uh, so our setups have to be mobile. We are, as I said, we we don't even have a studio. Um, we we can we travel and. Um, um, we um, will we'll go to a uh, faculty member's office, um, outdoors, we'll rent equipment uh, when we need to, um, and work, this was also for teach recovery, we worked with actors and scripts, um, and we'll, we, we'll, we'll go wherever one need, wherever we, a shoot is needed, we'll set up whatever needs to be um, done, and um, thanks to George Schusler and um, um, Angelo Miranda, they let us borrow their beautiful studio, so we've been able to um, take advantage of that and um, be able to work on Professor Pena's film, um, uh, film a MOOC, um, Major Trends in World Cinema. And so um, we've been very creative with that. And um, so uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of that background on, um, you know, sticking with uh, something that is um, small and really, I think our, our team um, really, really works closely in partnership with faculty who are developing MOOCs or developing any kind of um, online uh, uh, courses for, on, for online or in their classes in producing videos. And uh, um, I think the assessment piece of where the learning is happening um, is really important, and I think we have a lot to, ourselves, we still have a lot to learn how to measure that. How do we really measure and assess that? And, um, um, you know, the executive um, uh, director who spoke up here before the CTL, um, Kathy Takayama, to also um, mention that, how important that is. And so, um, I think that um, I want to open up this discussion. I hope we can discuss a little bit more about um, student participation I, and student contribution. And that's really, um, I think, where the learning happens. We've, we've learned from um, other courses that when students can contribute back, when they're able to ingest and they're able to critique and analyze and produce themselves and give back. So some of the ideas of, you know, uh, video commentary, and we've also talked about groups and um, how important that engagement, that touch point between the instructor and the student, the touch point that happens with um, small uh, focus groups, um, that that is the critical piece of um, videos and uh, of MOOCs, and videos can be a part of that. Um, and um, I think that's a, that's a big challenge for those of us who are, um, you know, uh, producers here. So, um, life beyond um, the MOOC, I, um, I, I hope we can open up the discussion a little bit more about that because life beyond the MOOC is really about taking all these pieces and being able to allow instructors to customize them, to be able to search, to find, to filter, to be able to then um, integrate them into their curriculum in any way that they see that they want to. And I think that's the life beyond the MOOC. So I'll leave it at that. So first of all, thank you, Peter, and the, and the center and the university uh, for inviting me uh, to present today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. It, all the panelists actually is a great segue to my presentation that's coming here. Um, really talking about breaking the unidirectionality of online video. It's, I'm going to be talking more about close analysis of time-based, um, time, linear time-based media, namely video, but there's also audio part of that. We know that by the middle of this decade, actually more than two-thirds of the video will be, more of, of, of web traffic content will be uh, web-based video. And we know that web-based video is becoming more and more a tool um, in teaching and learning, specifically in MOOCs. If you think about MOOCs, videos in MOOCs, MOOCs uh, videos are video-centric. MOOCs are very video-centric. 
Um, they, they rely on video tremendously, but there is a big problem with that. The delivery of online video is a passive event. The learning and teaching experience is just basically unidirectional these days. There's nothing where the, inter the students can interact. When and where can students ask their question in an online video? In a presential, in a face-to-face -face course, a student can, can raise their hand and ask a question. But in an in a online video, they cannot do that. Similarly, an instructor cannot answer back that question, specific question within that video. So how do we provide, provide mechanisms to do that? I'll give you a, a clear example. In MOOCs, there's a total disassociated engagement with the videos. If you think about how videos are presented in the edX platform but in all, in all uh, platforms, you have video and you have a big monolithic discussion forum. These discussion forums are completely disasso disassociated from the video uh, content. But there is a conversation about the video, and these are, these are real examples from the course. Here you see a question from a student. I'm sure this has been answered elsewhere, but I'm curious if someone can enlighten me. For, for an instructor or students to find this, the answers to these questions, they have to travel through the, the discussion forum, and they have to look at the matching timestamps between the video and the discussion forum. It is very disruptive. And you don't really understand unless you really take the time to do that, to go through the video. So how do we, how do we change that? It's by really designing a new video interface. And it's incorporating annotations into this video interface. But we need to remove the hindrances of this close analysis. We need to engage the students in a contextualized engagement with the video. So what does it mean? It means that we need to transform the online media player. And it's a media player that has, that is a media rich video, video annotation tool. Where you can actually not just, if you think about how it's structured, you want to annotate a video fragment, but you need to be able to add commentaries and texts and tags, but you also want to maybe attach a video to a video, a video fragment illustrating a video, an example of it. But you might also want to geolocate that video fragment on a map. Where is this video taking place? All this information, all this metadata is super important, but you also want to have students ask questions about this video and tag it as a question so that the instructor can then look for it. Over time, I've built several standalone applications and applications that have been embedded into uh, different learning management systems for uh, video annotation. Um, it went from the early days, early 2000s, using Flash and Adobe Air, which was the, the, the interactive media platform that, of preference at the time for the web. Um, and then we went to our, to our local um, content learning management system at Harvard, and then we open sourced the, the tools and then it evolved into the Open Video Annotation Project, which incorporated open source uh, code and rich media annotations. This, uh, op this open source uh, video annotation tool had basic analytics about annotation. You could see, you could dis define a fragment of where are the actual annotations. This is not clickstream data. This is actual data of the students interacting with the video. What are they annotating on the video? What are the fragments that they're really looking at? And you could see as an instructor, oh, there's probably a big conversation going on here. What, what is going on here? So that kind of simple analytics can give you a big opening into what is going on within the video. We took this, this technology and brought it into uh, the edX platform as part of a bigger project for annotations and on the edX platform um, and embedded it as an X module at the core level. I will not go into depth on that, but you can look at uh, the examples of these uh, tools that we built for the edX platform. They're still available there. There's some um, limitations to that because you need to install uh, external annotation uh, database to 
run it. So that that creates a little bit of an issue because it's also core co code that's part of the core in the in the X modules. It makes it more difficult to update. So the next transition to that was to build LTI tools that would be multi-platform. So it's an interoperable tool that actually can be embedded not just in LTI in any LTI compliant platforms. This is the path that is that is going that is that is being taken now um, at the Harvard X, but. Um, in full disclosure, I'm no longer working at Harvard X. And we're looking at beyond the, the LMSs and being able to embed these annotation tools, not just in an LMS, but in, an, in any content management system or HTML system. This is a shameless plug. I am also, I'm also um, work part-time for Critique It. I'm a a director for educational initiatives, and we are building such embeddable code that actually relies on a common core database. So we're talking about disrupting that unidirectionality of online video, but we also have to think not just about pedagogy, but also research, because research drives teaching, teaching drives research. And we know that from the very early days of video analysis, even from the very early days of video, they were already doing analysis. If you think about the, the um, Moybridge with his horse and showing that the horse did gallop with four, that the galloping did involve the four feet off the, four foot off the ground. Um, there's been a lot of studies in ethnographic studies. Um, anthropology has used video analysis to, to do some in-depth analysis of video, sorry. Currently, there's a lot of professors using um, video content and audio content in their research and in their teaching. One example here is Professor Richard Wolf at Harvard University. He's an ethnomusicologist who actually, use, who actually goes into the field and records audio and video of performers. And he uses these, and these are performers in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and there's different structures to the music and different structures to to the interpretations and presentations of the of the content, and he actually has to annotate the, this content so that it's explanatory and so students can understand what is going on. But he also has to annotate the raw video formats, the raw video footage, so that he can extract the different pieces, the salient pieces, and he uses those in both his class and his teaching and his personal websites to share that. So you have that multiplicity of of environments. One of the things that, and I'm going to another shameless plug we're trying to do and critique it is we're, flex we're, we're, we're customizing annotation environments. Um, we're, this customization is really to support teaching and research. With Professor Wolf, he has specific metadata fields that he needs to add to his, to his audio files. So he needs to define what's the location of where was this audio or, audio or video file taken. What's the language being spoken? Who are the performers on this video? So that then he can perform searches based on these. But the annotations are not just in the form of text. You can also annotate in the form of video or audio specifically. So you can engage directly with the face, face to face or, or audio to face. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do, and this is, this is huge, is, is dashboard analytics and and statistics and natural language processing. So you're aggregating annotation information and trying to present it in a meaningful way so that it, it's, a, it's a way that's a digest of, of information from the annotation um, entries. This is really, really important in massive open online courses, and I'll explain that in a little bit. If you think of, we were talking about just this disruption of unidirectionality, but Think about blended courses in learning environments, right? Where students are actually interacting with a whole bunch of content from um, open source content, uh, federated content, online distant education, face-to-face -face education, their personal learning environments, the flipped class classroom. These are all environments that can benefit from this kind of technology. So how do you keep track of this blended content? How do you support personal learning environments? creating study guides, review topics, flipped classrooms. Well, really, it's annotation systems that 
create this glue for blended and learning and personal environment. If you think about it, how do you, how do you aggregate your notes that you're taking across these different environments and then bring them into one specific area? Within Critique It, we have this out-of-the-box customized solutions for blended learning where you can actually do all of this and actually annotate all kind of media, text, images, audio, video, put customized tags and aggregate all this information into one main dashboard. All this information in one main dashboard can actually then relink back to the original sources. So you have your online notes that you can take away from you with your classroom. So now you, you're taking a class, an online class or an online MOOC, and you can, as a student, go away with all your notes that refer to different aspects, different parts of your course, be it images, audios, and videos, and text. So what are the implications for the MOOC space? Some of the early pilot testing that we did last year and the Harvard, at Harvard X on the edX platform um, for a poetry course where we tested some of our tools, piloted some of our tools, we had over 60,000 annotations in about seven weeks from students. This is a tremendous amount of contributions from different students, and it's close reading, focused annotations on the poems. We had students that annotated up to, that posted up to 700 annotations, individual students. It's incredible the amount of contributions. If you think about the learners that are present in the MOOCs, not just amateurs, but people who have probably studied, and there's information there that, that, that could be very, very relevant. But there are challenges in MOOCs. The MOOC, the, the, how, do you, how do you display thousands of annotations, and how do you stimulate engagement in, into answering these annotations? As our panelist earlier, and the keynote panelist earlier was talking about, that they read every single annotation. Yes, it's a big feat, but how do you make sure that you're understanding what is going on, and how do you take the temperature of the entire thing, of the entire course? How do you promote the discovery annotations? And how do you deal with accessibility and digital note-taking? People are not used to digital note-taking. There's, there's a literacy that has to happen at that level. And there's video player UI limitations. You still have to scrub. When you scrub and try to select a part of the video, it just jumps to another part of the video. And these are limitations that we have in our current technologies. The future UIs for online video, and I don't think about video video annotation tools, I think about them as video players that are actual, that actually have features of annotations. So you think about multimodal annotations, where if you remember in the edX platform, you have the transcripts of the video, but also being able to annotate the, the image of the video, the, frag, the, the selecting areas of the video, connecting them to the, to the transcripts and seeing how that, how that information is connected and there might be some additional information. But take it beyond that. Think about 3D video that's coming, that's coming soon. Multidimensional annotations, where not, you're not just annotating the frame, but you're also annotating a space, and you're annotating over time. So you have four dimensions to deal with. Future of data analysis, you know, can we compare student engagement? Completion rates to annotation engagement? How do we measure all these things? Do annotations exercise increase the completion rates. We might not care about completion rates, but do they, are, do they add value? A-B testing, for example. And think, think about assessment rubrics inside of annotations. I can now present a video, and along the video as it's playing, show some questions that students have to answer to see if they're, they're competent in what they have learned across this video, and go on to the next and keep on watching this video, and then grab this information and, and analyze it later on. Think about natural language processing and think and doing sentiment analysis. Through in critique it, we're doing sentiment sentiment analysis of the annotations to see is it a positive or is it negative overall? What's going on in the class? It gives you a temperature a little bit of, of what this what is what is happening within the course. This retroactive analysis of of the data coming from commentaries, so text analysis, structural and topical modeling, syntactic pattern recognitions, and post course interviews with course participants and instructors. So really what I want you to think about is transforming this video delivery that is no longer just unidirectional. It, it helps close watching. You can create study guides, but think about formative assessment. Think about qualitative assessment of the, of the, of the videos. Close watch analytics, course analytics, natural language processing. If there's something that I want you to come away from is these terms that are coming into play. And also think about the, the 
content management systems and learning management systems are really an ephem are ephemeral because they go away. But annotations and the, the stable uh, digital repositories, the annotations that are tied to them should remain over time. So we have to have systems that are that that can define that can be defined and persist over time so that you so that you have annotations that can persist over time. And that's basically removing that and keeping those two connections. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Phil, thank you very much for that um, close. You know, any any panel that has uh, annotating 3D video at the end of it is just a pretty awesome panel. But also any panel where, you know, Columbia, we're 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 given 850 gigs of highly produced video at the beginning is also <laughs> terrific. So, our panelists, thank you, thank you so much. Um, what I'd, I'd like to do is open the um, floor for questions. We have a few minutes left. We're going to go into a town hall. Um, there are only a few minutes. If anybody would like to um, ask a question of our distinguished group here. Well, Michael as Delia. the mic runner, I'm going to be completely rude and ask the, uh, <laughs> the first question. He's a plant from our own organization. <laughs> so I um, thank you for everyone uh, speaking today. I, I, uh, as somebody who would like to push back on uh, some of the hate or the, um, the expression of evilness against the um, the lecture, um, I'm wondering uh, w at what point do we think we've gone too far? For example, um, when do we think that, um, how do we know that we're not going in the way of, of making MOOCs the sort of um, doing the same thing that USA Today has done for newspapers, right? <laughs> sort of dumbing it down too much. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the and when I expressed uh, some doubt about the lecture in general, uh, it's not about lecture as a form. It's about the length <laughs> and screen time that uh, students uh, have shown in behavioral studies. So uh, I think that I don't want to go away from the lecture necessarily. In some cases, it's very productive. Um, and more generally, I would take and uh, just like George Orwell's rules for writing, um, I'd break any of the rules before uh, I break the content. Um, there are certain uh, disciplines that need more time than others, and uh, that's a negotiation between um, the sort of technical advisors um, and the pedagogical people and the, the actual faculty. Um, I would certainly not want to get in the way of the content uh, if that discipline had, or even some portion of the material called for an extended consideration. I mean, one thing that, that I would say about that is not, it's not so much um, getting completely away from lecture, um, but more getting away from lecture capture, certainly, um, and thinking about content uh, in a way that's more engaging, right, and thinking about the modal shift that a lot of faculties have to go through. You know, most faculty members, most instructors are trained in a very theatrical performance. Um, and what, what, what I often talk about when I, when I get to talk to uh, faculty and during training um, is really about understanding that mode shift and being able to interact with the camera. Um, while it is unidirectional, uh, if you are uh, having a conversation, you are having it with a student and you may be having it thousands or hundreds of thousands of time, but it really is a one-to-one -one conversation. Um, and I think a lecture is really more about trying to engage an entire audience, which hopefully I'm doing for all of you right now. Um, but uh, truthfully, it's really about changing that and changing about the tonality of the, of the performance, really. Hi, uh, I'm very excited about the high quality, movie quality, TV quality, whatever, very good uh, videos that, that these are. And I think there's a lot of promise uh, in terms of encouraging student engagement and maybe even in increasing the learning. Uh, but also concerned about the cost. So what can you tell me about about those three factors? How um, how are there any numbers to or uh, yeah, how, how much does this increase student engagement and participation and how popular are these MOOCs uh, with the really high quality video? And 
is there any evidence to show that they have better learning outcomes? And then also, how much do they cost and, and can, can you expect to recoup that cost uh, somehow to justify that, that high investment? Sure. Um, so uh, one of the MOOCs has not run at all, so I can't give you much of anything about that. Um, and in fact, the, the second piece that I played, um, I actually, it has high production value, but it's not necessarily, it, it's highly produced, but it's, it's not necessarily a high cost, right? They're doing a lot of that in the green screen studio. Um, in fact, the other piece, which is from UQ, they have you know, a fairly low cost uh, studio setup solution that they've shared with all of, uh, all of the edX partners. It's around 10K, around $10,000 to build a studio, and that's something that can be repurposed over and over again. Um, as far as the cost, I can't speak to the, the first piece that I showed you uh, as to what that, that actually cost uh, to make. Um, but what I can say about that is, you know, this is, this is one of their, was one of their first three or four MOOCs, I believe? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I have a UQ person in the audience, so I, you know, okay. <laughs> um, and I think it really was more of an experimentation to figure out if that is functional, if that is engaging, and truthfully, what are those learning outcomes? Because I don't think we have the answers to that. Um, and I think this is a, a time for that experimentation. Um, but as has been mentioned many times, um, you know, sustainability is a concern, right? What does that cost? And is it is it truly, you know, um, uh, entertainment? is engaging, but it isn't necessarily academic engaging. And engagement does not necessarily mean learning, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you've actually taught them something. And so those are, are pieces that are still, there's still research, much research to be done. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately for me, I get to par, par, kick the can down there slightly. <laughs> uh, one, last, one last question, and then we have to open up the uh, auditorium for our town hall. I was just going to say the motivation for some of these high quality videos is you know, for that one and the, the crime course in when they t taught that in class they could use snippets from TV programs. Mm -hmm. We couldn't do that in a MOOC. So we created a, a resource that is now Creative Commons, can be used by mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. teaching this sort of subject anywhere. So I think the value is there by putting the learning in context. And a lot of these high quality videos are all about that, providing a context that you would never be able to have in a lecture theatre. Yeah. You know, showing someone in their lab or, or a, a, in their research um, situation in the field. Um, so that's the motivation rather than just high quality. Sure. Yeah, uh, just to add to that really quickly, uh, the animated MOOC, uh, not Rob's, but the second one, our Applying to U.S. Universities MOOC uh, that we did, the reason we ended up animating it was the need for images uh, was going to be so prohibitive that uh, we needed to just make them on our own. Um, and that was actually going to save us money in the long term because it was a uh, significant time savings labor costs uh, just for the full-time staff employees. Uh, it, it really was worth it, just a little bit of extra animation. Um, let me just add that <clears throat> uh, the topic of producing, distributing, archiving, preserving uh, video and all the legal and other aspects involved in it, the technologies, the, um, you know, norms, um, it could warrant its own sort of uh, conference on, you know, um, sort of video and MOOCs, and it, it might be beneficial in the future to think about this learning with MOOCs conference as, you know, to also to have breakout sort of conferences throughout the year where video professionals, video people who are um, passionate about video kind of get brought together um, uh, just like we've brought together so many people here but on particular core topics such as this one. And in, in that light, I should also add that at a university such as ours, there are so many stakeholders in the future of, of uh, t t teaching and learning and best practices when it comes to publishing um, it, whatever medium, and, and in video in particular, I see Adam Stefan here in, in the back, uh, who's producing at, at uh, the School of International Affairs, and we have the School of Continuing Education, and we have the Columbia Video Network, and we have so many aspects to our to our work at the law school, at the medical school, even uh, Michelle Hall can uh, uh, just narrate. Um, uh, I think um, it, it's also useful to 
look inward and kind of smoke out the stakeholders in the future video at each of our own institutions as we think about uh, especially some of the resource questions that Stephanie uh, was raising, which are dear to, dear to all of us. So um, please join me in a uh, final thank you for our um, great video panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.